get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same Like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com. What you're about to experience is uh, a little bit different. This interview had, we talked about rejection. We talked about turning points. And you'll see, I did a separate intro because um, I had Jason Cement and Elon Gold. And Elon Gold just jumped straight into it. And so I kind of skipped over the intro. But I do want to point uh, out to, to other episodes to check out. Um, because of today's guest, which is, by the way, um, Elon Gold is one of the funniest people on the planet. He's one of my all-time favorite comedians. So he does not disappoint in this interview. So check it out. Um, other episodes to check out, uh, we talked, you'll see in the beginning, we talked about Moise Navone of Mobileye. Uh, Mobileye was acquired for $15.2 billion by Intel. Craig Weiss, uh, CEO of Retainer Club, um, who you know, previously his company built to a $1 billion valuation. And he actually yelled at me for sending him a large box of Omaha steaks as a gift because I didn't realize his wife was a rabbi and he kept kosher and there was pork in the box. Uh, so Noah Alper, he sold Noah ba Noah's bagels to Einstein bagels for hundred million dollars. He started out selling religious tchotchkes out of his trunk. And, and this all relates to today's episode, which uh, talks, you know, actually, you'll see, watch Elon Gold's, um, you know, what he does on James Corden, um, his appearance on James Corden. And he starts off with what this, all these three people are linked to and what it relates to. So check out that. Um, this is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I found no better way to give to my relationships than over the past over decade than have them on my podcast, profile them, shout from the rooftops what they're doing, what their company is doing. So other people check it out. And so if you have questions, you can go to, if you ever thought about starting a podcast, you can go to rise25.com. If you have questions, you can email us anytime. Happy to help. Now check out this episode today. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And, you know, I always like to mention Elon and Jason, past guests of the podcast, so people can check out other people. And specifically because of today's guests, I want to mention past guests who are part of my Israeli business leader series. I had uh, Moise Navone of Mobileye. He talks about how they were acquired for $15.2 billion by Intel. He's a uh, friend of mine, by the way. Is he really? He's a good friend of mine. And all I ask him every time I see him is, what was your cut exactly? What was your, what did, what was your takeaway? <laughs> Does Just he give tell it you? To me. Can we buy a house in Herzliya? What can we do now? No. Doesn't very answer. Candid. Not Doesn't candid, answer. I mean, the opposite. He's very uh, closed. He's interesting because he went on, as you know, and um became a rabbi while he was doing this and now he's getting his phd he's the coolest sweetest guy all he cares about is god and judaism and his people and homeland and family and it, he, he's not interested in the money he made it's like a byproduct of his work and now mm -hmm. he could focus on the things that matter yeah yeah and i'm gonna formally choose jason elon but we'll get yes, right please. into and it by elon. the way enough <laughs> about him enough yeah, about him he's doing just fine we don't need to dedicate another podcast to moise navone and his little mobile eye company <laughs> <laughs> have you what have you learned from him knowing him from, from, from moise yeah to care about the important things in life to i mean this is a guy the, the cool thing about this and i don't want to get too deep into Judaism, but he does this thing in Israel where he takes people into the sea. It's too, it's too crazy to explain, but it's about tzitzit and, and tzitzit and how you, you know, anyway, I can't even explain it. It's too hard to explain. But the fact that he did that, like scuba diving, mixing like this recreational fun sport of scuba diving with this holy practice of Judaism, where there's certain garments that you have to make holy and, and it's, 
from a dye from a fish in the sea that you get. And anyway, and the fact that he has so much love, he has so much love for his heritage, culture, rituals, traditions, and he does it with pure joy, a smile on his face, and he'll take you to the ocean and do this ritual. It's like he does things out of love. So I, what I learned from him is do what really, focus on what matters and do it with love, whatever it is, whether it's your religion or your vocation or your vacation. Just do things and love what you're doing while you're doing them. You know, the part of his journey, also, by the you way. know, Jason, and, um, the part of his journey that struck me in the interview was, you know, we hear these ups, right? Like we'll talk about, you know, your ups, you've been on the James Corden show, you've been on, you know, your a a recurring role in Curb Your Enthusiasm. Mostly canceled sitcoms, but yes. <laughs> and I want to hear the Pamela Anderson story that also of relates course. to Judaism in some, some realm. But, but what strikes me about it, and you both will reflect the same, is the the challenging and the down times that people don't see, they see these high points and he had to go back and tell his kids and his wife, he had to pull them all out of all extracurriculars. They had to stop eating out because the journey of the business, it was on a downturn and Correct. they had to cut that stuff out. And it's so funny that you say that because it happens to me on a daily basis because show business is all downtime with a few slight ups. And it's all rejection with a few every now and then some uh, a nicety or some affirmation that you have any sort of talent or you're good at what you do. And, you know, for me, the way I exist in life is thanks to stand up comedy. You can take all the rejection of show business by day and then you go at night and kill it at the comedy cellar and you got, you know, 100 people cracking up and you go, oh, they were wrong earlier today. These people are right. They know what they're talking about. I am funny <laughs> because it's just nothing but rejection. But what I experience regularly, especially lately, is people coming over to me saying, you know, you're my favorite comedian or I think you're really funny or... Uh, we love you, but they always qualify it. There's always a qualifier and a preface. What's the preface? I don't want to boost your ego, but I don't want you to get too full of yourself. And I stop them and I go, I just want you to know, I love this compliment and I appreciate this compliment. This will never swell my head. It will never get to me. What it is is saving me from killing myself. Not that I'm actually suicidal, but like what you don't understand about my life is it's all downtime, it's all rejection, and this compliment is really helpful to me. It will not affect my ego in any way, uh, uh, trust me. So give it to me and tell me how much you love me because I need it. I certainly don't get it at home. It'll anyway. save your life as opposed to giving you a big Correct. ego. Well, let's talk about, you know, way, I love how we didn't even intro anybody we, yet. I will, I'll You're come doing back amazing, to, I'll come Dr. Back J. I love this, that you like, forget these intro. He's been on this show and that show. And Jason is an entrepreneur who started <laughs> any company. Nobody cares. Let's get to the goods. Yeah. And on that, you know, a lot of times people's rejections fuel them. Right. And so I want to hear from each of you. What are the biggest rejection or biggest, you know, down? that you had uh, in the career. Um, and so Alana, by the way, by yeah, the way, ahead. how much time do we I think the list be? No, no, I have some predictions of what you're going to say, Alon, but what, what would you say? And is, Dr. J, by yeah, the way, because yeah. you know, we cut you off because you were going to do these nice intros. It is important for your listeners though, that they yeah. do know that I have a recurring role in the upcoming season of Curb <laughs> Your Enthusiasm, because you know, that's just, that just validates my uh, existence and why they would continue listening. They, oh, he's on Curb this season? I'll, I'll listen to what he has to say. You know, or he was the guy with Pamela Anderson on Stacked, that you know, Fox show that was canceled after 15 episodes. Nobody cares. So now I have to just give myself an intro. You can see him this season. On, okay, anyway, the, I'll let Jason talk because I've already talked too much, but the, I'll just say one thing about rejection and it really is too plentiful. To, to we, we, it's not hours, it's months we would have to go into, but the biggie that, that, that always uh, rests with me in, in an uncomfortable way is the dream since I was 15 and watched Billy Crystal and Martin Short and Eddie Murphy on SNL was to be on SNL. And I screen tested for Saturday Night Live and 
when I say I got close, I mean I was in the final like 10 of which six or seven were chosen. And it was in those 10 were guys like Will Ferrell. And it was that season. And, and I remember I had to go meet Lauren. It was a series of, it was 35 people got to test. And that's, that's whittled down from hundreds and hundreds that auditioned at comedy clubs and sent tapes and whatever. And then you get 35 that go to Studio 8H at 30 Rock and get to actually sit on the stage with Lauren there and with, and then it gets whittled down to another 10 or 12, like less than a dozen that get a second test. But in between the two tests, you have to meet with Lauren. And it was me and Will Ferrell, who I didn't know at the time. I just, you know, just waiting to go into Lauren. And he went first and then I went in. And I just remember looking at Will and thinking to myself, this poor guy, he'll never do anything. You can't even see his eyes. He's got these beady little eyes. He was this big, oafy, weird looking guy. And I was like, he'll never do anything. He's the biggest comedy movie star in the last two decades. But anyway, so don't ever listen to me is what I'm trying to say. But, but not getting coming that close to where literally the New York Post said, still in the running is Elon Gold, out of the running is Jim Brewer. And the exact opposite happened. Jim got it, and I was cut. And that, having a dream just cut off like that is so painful, like so painful. And then the most recent dream was being in Curb Your Enthusiasm last season, one scene, and being cut out of that. And Larry, who's a big mensch, called me, and I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, we'll find something else for you. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, uh, you know, is there gonna be, how likely is another season? Likely, uh, likely. And he kept his word, he's a mensch, and now I'm in a few episodes. So, but at the time, that rejection of getting cut, and he explained to me, it wasn't personal. It doesn't even have to be personal because he said, the episode ran too long. You and I were both really funny in it and great in it. And any scene that doesn't move the story forward has to go. It just has to go. When you're mm -hmm. running 10 minutes long, you can't stop for the doctor waiting room bit. You gotta go right into the doctor's office. And so it's, it's just daily. It's daily, but we'll let Jason do a little so bit. So Jason, <laughs> I wanna hear your rejection down point but so I'm, I'm going to just brief intro. Jason and I were talking business. We mentioned Elon, who I'm a big fan of. And Jason's the founder and CEO of Get Visible, digital marketing agency that helps companies with their website, search engine rankings, online ad campaigns, much more. And as Elon mentioned, um, you know, I'll, Elon Gold, comedian, actor, on Stacked. He has a Netflix special, one of my favorites, Chosen Thank and you. You've Taken. Seen it? Of course. Oh, that's so nice. Chosen it's now intake. streaming on Amazon Prime. Yeah, am, ex, you took the words out of my mouth. Um, the Tonight, he had appearance, 10 appearances on The Tonight Show, recurring role on Fox, hit show Bones, uh, more and more. Frasier, The Mentalist, Chappelle's show. You got to check out his bit on James Corden. Uh, that's hilarious. a good set. Isn't that and, a fun set? And uh, amazing set, yeah. Uh, oh, Elon Dr. Gold. J, com, you're, so. you're almost too kind. Uh, it's this, it's, it's all genuine? the truth. I'm not even trying to be kind. I it just it's the oh, truth. So, nice. so thank you, um, Jason. By the way, you didn't yeah, qualify ahead. it with, and I don't want to fill your head up, or I don't want you didn't. You just said it. That's how it should be. Mazel tov. Yeah, Go exactly. Ahead. Jason, your biggest rejection down challenge. So it works differently for me because I don't have the recall and the memory like Elon will have about all these episodes in his life. For me, it's like a 15 year rejection that keeps going. And so it's not necessarily the rejection, but when you're in a sales capacity building a company, 99% of what you spend your time on does not materialize into actual business. So if you're, uh, there's a guy that I watch uh, some of his videos, I think his name is Bradley, uh, Bradley TV or something like that. And he talks about a salesperson has to not think about the rejection from a negative standpoint. They just have to think about it as a stepping stone until they get the deal. So you can watch statistics where they'll tell you who are the superstar salespeople. Those are the ones that call that company the third, fourth, and fifth time. Most people, they burn out after the second call. They go, they don't like me. They make up all sorts of excuses. And so granted for what Elon does, and waking up in the daytime to all of those people that ignore you and then going to do the show at night, the problem is you go back to sleep and you wake up in the morning and it starts that cycle all over again. So you hope that the high you experience at night can carry you through the next day. So in the world of business, 
it's really the same thing. And it's, it's almost more difficult than my world because we get commoditized. Elon, you either like him or you don't like him. I mean, personally, but in terms of the comedy, ah, my one joke. So it's like you either like the jokes or you don't like the jokes. It's, there's no commoditization. But for a business, you are a service business, you often get commoditized where people say, well, look, I can hire 20 digital marketing agency. What makes you different? So that starts getting at you every day. You're looking for differentiation and then compounded by dozens of clients who are expecting us to find differentiation for them because yeah. they're also getting commoditized because we do a lot of service uh, businesses. And so by the way, actually, off of that, the yeah. difference between us is, and I know you're more in the service business, but let's say any other company that's selling a product, you know, you could sell a product and oversell it, whether it's a stupid vacuum cleaner or a food item. It's so weird when the product is you, isn't it? Or like what your service, what your service provides. We are the product. We are the product. We are the product. Absolutely. And I'll tell you something funny. It's sort of like Elon was joking about his very handsome shirt before. And I once did a test. I put on a suit for six months. I wanted to see if it would make a difference in, in getting more deals. And it did. But I didn't mm. want to be the guy wearing a suit. So I took it off anyway, making a sacrifice because I didn't feel authentic. I know I have a nice shirt on now, but honestly, it's I didn't. It's not that nice. It's okay. You're right. But I wanted to be authentic all the way through to who I am. And so I just didn't want to play the game 100% even though sometimes you have to, but it's, it's uh, getting back to your theme about rejection. It's a mindset at the end of the day. It's, it's, if you're lucky enough to have people that make you feel good on, in your personal inner circle, then hang the phone up on me 20 times. and don't care. Cause on the 21st, I'm getting a deal. So you, as long as you keep plugging along and Elon, you, how many years are you in comedy now? Almost 30, but there is something to be said, getting back to your suit thing. Yeah. About presentation and, you know, judging a book by its cover. You know, when you present yourself in a suit, it is a whole different perception. And, you know, I, it always bothered me when I'd watch a stand up special. And, like, for example, you see a stand up special with Jerry. Yeah. There he is, suit and tie. Now, I don't think that comedians need to wear suit and ties necessarily. But an outfit, you know, dress up, like, for example, even if it's Eddie Murphy in Delirious and it's a red leather suit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not a suit and tie, but it shows he cares. I care to put on a show and to present myself as the rock star that I am. And then you would see, you know, specials. And that's the newest way of guys like Louis C.K. who show up in a black T-shirt. And I'm like, and that's his style and good for him. And his material is so amazing. It doesn't even matter what he's wearing. But I, I don't like that. I, I want to see a guy that's showing us that they care. And whenever I get hired, whenever I get hired for a gig, a private gig, a fundraiser, whatever it is, I will always dress up and show them I'm not just showing up here and I don't give a crap about this gig. This gig is important to me as, as every other gig. I remember speaking to Seinfeld, he made that funny joke about in an interview, what it's not part of a stand-up, like he approaches stand-up the way he approaches a first date. He goes, I will, I will take a shower. I will put on a sport jacket, you know, a nice pair of shoes. And it's like, it's funny that like, it's again, on a date, you want to present yourself. You want to be presentable. So I disagree, Jason, go back to the suit. That shirt is horrible. <laughs> you know, Jason, you bring up a point though, you know, there's parallels, obviously a lot of parallels between business, like pure business, pure comedy. And, you know, you talk about, well, I'm commoditized. Well, there are also a lot of comedians out there. And I think, you know, the, you, you mentioned differentiation. I think um, there is an evolution in, you know, for you, Elon, starting out, I know you did a lot of impressions, right? And your comedy has probably evolved a lot from the beginning. So and, and I want to hear, you know, I, I want to hear a little bit even going back to the skits you wrote for Purim as a kid, they were impressions. And Jay, so I want to hear, Jason, your favorite impressions that Elon does. And Elon, your, your personal favorites, maybe they're you know, underrated, maybe they're not. Um, so Jason, what are, because that's the evolution of comedy too. So Jason, what are your favorite impressions? Oh, clearly uh, Gilbert Gottfried. 
Oh, stop it. It's too much. I can't. I can't. Could you could you do a little, Gilbert? No, no, not even a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know who, who's your favorite, Elon. I, I first of all, I have too many. And also I I've noticed that my act, this is how old I am. Most of the people that I've been doing for decades in my act gone. are gone now. <laughs> like mm. literally, we just lost Jackie Mason. Jackie Mason was like the greatest Jewish comedian that ever lived. And I love just going into talking a person like this. It makes me nauseous to think that a person in my position has to be on a podcast with someone else. I'd like to be the only guest. Now I got to share it. I got two <laughs> guests. It's a miserable thing. Who is this Jason Cement? What has he done? Has he had any canceled sitcoms? It's nauseating. It makes me nauseous. And, you know, and then, and, and I just love doing impressions where the character is so big that you get to have fun. Of course, Trump is just so much fun. You know, I mean, you look at, you know, you look at this podcast and you see a very bright guy, a very intelligent guy, you know, Dr. J is a genius guy. And then you look at Jason and, you know, he's got this horrible shirt on and he's a smart guy, but he doesn't know how to dress. He doesn't know how to dress. And he doesn't know whether to put on a suit and tie. You know what? I always wear a suit and tie. And that's why I close my deals. I close deals. I'm a deal closer. So it's just fun to riff. But it's very, that's a great question because the evolution of being a guy who just did impressions to finding my voice, which is, which takes over or took me over 20 years. So many of my heroes, guys like Jim Carrey, Billy Crystal, you know, Jim Carrey used to just go on stage and just do impressions. And, and I think I, I can relate and I'm not comparing. He's like probably top 10 talented human beings that ever lived on the planet, like along with Eddie Murphy, uh, Richard Pryor, Jamie Foxx, Robin Williams. Like there's certain people, Sammy Davis, there's certain people, Prince, who you could put in the top 10 ever have so much talent. They're just beyond people. They're just balls of talents and energy. And they're almost not human. And, and, but Jim Carrey used to, used to just do impressions. And I think that like him, we were afraid to talk on stage as ourselves. We were afraid to be ourselves. So my entire act as a 16 year old kid, and it was, I think, yeah, it was, I think I was 16, 17 when I first went to the comic strip. And all I did was impressions of other comedians with my own material. I would write mm -hmm. material in their voice and it would be all was the, Jimmy Fallon like that too. He started off basically just Jimmy, doing impressions. Jimmy actually, and and you know, I'm not going to uh, get into the me and Jimmy Fallon uh, riff, but he sort of saw what I was doing and came over to me and said, "I'm a huge fan." Oh man, I'm such a huge fan of yours. Oh man, and then he started doing a few similar impressions like Gilbert Gottfried and all these other impressions that I was already doing, and you know, I have no beef with him, and I, 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 I. I He's done, he's done quite well for himself. Um, so I don't want to even come off as, as like the jealous, scorned lover who, you know, he went off and I'm still struggling on a podcast with Jason. But, <laughs> but the point is, but the point is he, you know, he came over to me one night at Saturday Night Live party and, and asked me to teach him how to do my Howard Stern impression. And I was like, no, 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 I can't just let you steal my impression. He was like, well, Lauren's asking me to do it. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm like, but I don't want to because... When you develop an impression, it is a hook and it is an observation that you're making about the way someone is, his aura, his, his um, vocal, yeah. uh, you know, it, 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 the way he, he speaks, the, what he would say, she would say. So you are making this original observation, even though impressions are, are pretty much frowned upon by the purest comedians. It's like juggling. It's just a trick. And it really is a magic trick. It's, it's really just a trick and the audience is going, how does he do that? You know, it's not pure comedy that, you know, it doesn't touch your soul and it doesn't make you reflect and, and relate to the comedian, which is really what stand-up's about. It's just a magic trick. But the point is, it's, there's still something in there where you have to put the work in and make the observation. Now, once someone does an impression, it's very easy to do an impression of an impression. And that's what everybody does with Trump and all the like big impressions it used to be like, 
that Jim from Taxi Guy or everyone was doing, uh, who was everyone doing at the time, like in the 80s and 90s? It was, it was all the presidents. It was like Richard Nixon or Johnny Carson. You know, Johnny Carson mm. is, some, is an impression. Now, nobody knows. Now, no one knows what I'm doing right now, but I am doing a, a guy who hosted The Tonight Show before Jimmy Fallon and sounded exactly like this. Is that right? Is that true? Is that right? And, you know, and that, those are impressions that a lot of people do. So I never wanted to do those. I always prided myself in finding the hook of people that no one's doing. So no one was doing all these comedians. I was literally doing comedians that didn't even pop yet, like Gilbert, like Howard Stern. I was the first person to ever do Howard Stern when Howard Stern wasn't even national. He was in the tri-state area in LA. It was before the book, the movie, and obviously before he was national and serious and all that. And Howard was so impressed by the impression and by the fact that somebody's even doing him and no one knows him that he invited me on the show. And then I've been on the show since a few times and whatever, but, oh, well, this is very exciting, Robin. Let me tell you something. This Dr. J guy, he's a bright guy. Am I right, Robin? (laughs) Anyway, but the point is, so you find the hook and you do the impressions. And when someone asks you to steal that hook, you're not inclined to just give it away as you wouldn't be inclined to give away an observation of a joke you have. Hey, can I do that joke that you're doing? No, it's my joke. I thought of that. So, and everyone's very protective of that. And every guy that does impressions, and I don't consider myself an impressionist, I consider myself a comedian who does impressions. You know, there's Rich Little, there's all these guys that are really just impressionists. And then there are comedians who do impressions like the aforementioned Billy Crystal and all these guys that I admired and Eddie. So, but the point is the progression and the evolution of years and years of getting away from impressions and finding my voice and doing bits and observations in my voice. And what do I care about? What do I like talking about? And what's my point of view? That took years. And now I just sort of sprinkle impressions as a little, you know, if you saw my hour special, I did a few impressions here and there, but mostly it's, it's me yeah. talking as me. And that took forever to come out of my shell to, you know, I'll never forget my, my older brother, Stephen, saw me uh, like two years into me doing stand up, and I was doing a bit as me. And he goes, you, you, were, you were talking like you. I, I, I'd never seen that on stage. It was incredible to hear you on stage. I'm like, I know, I know. It was, it was rough, but... You know, that's what was there a point, you know, and one of my favorites that you do um, is when you do the potty book and you do a slew of impressions. So I I urge people to check that out. Um, Yes, you could see that on YouTube or you could see it on the special on YouTube. It's just a singular like three minute bit, but that's fun. And that happened out of a real situation where I'm reading the potty book to my kids and it's boring reading the same stupid book, you know, potty book every night to your kids, whatever. Not that that's the book I read every night, but you know, you read it a few times. So I just to entertain myself, not my two year old who doesn't know who I'm doing. I just started doing different. Like imagine if, you know, Barack Obama, uh, let me be clear. You have to go to the potty. Now, are you making a number one or number two? You know, or just doing Ray Romano. Oh, and then the, the potty, the, 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 the baby uh, misses the potty. Oh, and then the duty is on the floor. Bad. No. Why? Anyway, and I just started doing that for <laughs> me. I'm reading this book in different voices, literally just to entertain myself. And then I went, I should do this. And it was fun. You just take the book out and it's a little closer. And I stopped doing it. I retired it because I did it on a special. And you always want to move on and keep writing and growing. Transitioning from doing the impressions, the next evolution of yourself. Do you remember a point where there's yourself and then there's actually, um, I don't know if it was difficult for you or not, but to talk and actually do Jewish related jokes to not a Jewish audience? So that's another evolution. And that's, by the way, that's a whole other podcast. Jason, I'm sorry. We're not going to have a time. Um, but that. Look, was I, was the some- shit, I was the shotgun here to put you guys together. So I'm enjoying it. It, it. You're right. It was a combination of, you know, you, you have to, as a writer, write what you know and write what you care about. And all I know is my very Jewish life. I mean, I'm observant. I keep kosher, Shabbat. I put on tefillin, all that stuff. So you can't turn off your observational eye when you're sitting in shul. You have a thought that's funny, and then you want to go on stage and tell it, 
but you can't go to the laugh factory or the comedy cellar and be like, Hey, you know, that mechitza and a what, you know, what are you talking about? So I started developing two separate acts. One was a totally Jewish act that I would do for synagogue events or fundraisers or, or I go to Israel and perform there. And then it's the secular act that you see in my special that I do at clubs or at corporate events or whatever. And, but what I really tried to do is meld the two. And that's what I've been working on for a few years. And also my manager, I mean, literally 10 years ago said, you, you've got to lean into the Jewish thing and you've got to own it even more because, and that's why like, you know, the name of my special is Yolanda Gold Chosen and Taken. And it's based on a joke about me being married and Jewish and, and, you know, just chosen, just that is like, there it is in the title. Oh, here's a Jewish guy. And just leaning into that. Cause he, he explained to me, he goes, you know, you write really good relationship material, but there are comedians that write better. You write really good uh, political humor, but there are comedians, the Bill Maher, that they, they're better. Because no one is better at the insights into Judaism, into our culture and heritage. No one. And I go, well, I think Jackie Mason's way better. He goes, but even Jackie Mason, who's as brilliant as he was, would really go surface Judaism, cultural Judaism. He would never go deep. I wish he did. And he would never talk about our rituals, customs, holidays that I like to poke fun. I don't make fun. I poke fun at them as an insider. And, you know, he wouldn't do that. So he said, you got to, if you're the best at something, lean into that. Just do that. But now I'm trying to, and again, the last few years, really meld and mix and make it where that I, you know, identify always as a Jewish guy and that my point of view is everything as this Jewish comedian but also relatable. It has to be relatable. And, but I learned a lesson a few years ago because what I do is I, I still shy away from getting too Jewish, as they say, in front of a non-Jewish audience. And I learned a lesson not to even do that. I saw, um, went to see my old pal Dave Chappelle at who played Howard Stern, uh, Robin Quivers to my Howard Stern and those sketches that Howard saw and loved and invited me on and didn't even know. He's like, oh, who's this guy doing Robin? He's great. And I'm like, oh, that's Dave Chappelle's a young comedian. He's great. No one knew who he was at the time. And, um, but I went to see Chappelle at Radio City and his guest star, uh, he always brings up a few com other comedians before he comes on, was Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart, at Radio City Music Hall, predominantly black audience, starts doing bits about a Seder plate and I'm, um, and people are laughing and I'm like, that's it. I'm never going to be afraid to get too inside baseball, Judaism, baseball. I'm never going to be too afraid. If these guys are laughing at a Seder plate, then maybe they have some frame of reference and they have friends who had Seder and they know what a Seder is and they know what Passover is. Just, 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 don't be afraid, be true to yourself, write what you know, write what you care about, and people will laugh. You know, sometimes, Gary, a perfect example of this is Gary Goldman, who's literally top three most brilliant, um, prolific. What? He's a great observationist. Observationist, comedians of the day, like yeah. literally as far as prolific and constantly writing and the greatest material he's up there with, you know, John Mulaney, Dave Attell, Ricky Gervais, like all these top guys that are just so brilliant. So Gary Goldman and I had this conversation. He goes, you know, I just saw your, um, like by accident, I came up on YouTube, your bit about the Jewish calendar is the only calendar with minutes on it. You know, every other calendar has months, weeks, days, no minutes, right? You don't open up like an American calendar, look at an American holiday be like oh martin luther king day starts at 5 48 ends the next day at 6 52. you don't have that but <clears throat> all of our jewish holidays literally have a start time and every shabbat every friday on the calendar it has a time it has minutes it has shabbat starts at 5 39. and he said that's a brilliant bit that the jewish calendar is the only calendar with minutes on it why aren't you doing that in your regular act and i went don't you have to grow up with that calendar on your fridge, with the times, with the minutes, to really appreciate? He goes, no. He goes, all you have to do is explain it. All you have to do is just tell people what the Jewish calendar has, and then they'll appreciate that it's the only calendar with minutes on it. I said, okay, fine, I agree, but 
the ones who did have that calendar growing up will relate and connect on such a deeper level. And it'll be so much more powerful to them because they live with that. And otherwise, it's just like, what's he talking about? There's minutes on what? And then they're laughing because it's kind of funny. But yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing. And it's, it's so funny that you bring that up. You're so insightful because I've, I've been through two evolutions of impressions to regular me and also me to Jewish me. That's good questions. There's, we should you have know, done this podcast years ago. Years ago. I'm going to, you know, Jason, I know you have to hop off in, in a bit, but I want to ask a question to you for a second. But I am going to circle back, Elon, too, because you do talk about the commonalities between blacks and Jews, which I, I want to, you know, go deeper in. And I'd love to hear your favorite. Um, Jewish bits by non-Jewish comedians. Mm. My personal is Sebastian Maniscalco. Sebastian's the, uh, Passover Seder is the know, greatest it's, thing. It's, it's amazing. The greatest, yeah. greatest bit. Um, so we'll, we'll circle back to that. But I want to talk about turning points. And when we talk about the intersection with comedy and business, like the hustle, right? The hustle of the comedy and business. And you, you mentioned Curb Your Enthusiasm, right? There's no better story about hustle than, than you meeting Larry David, which we'll go back to. But how do you, you know that story? For, for you, I'm not Jason, even public about it. I, I just do my research. Wow. So, Jason, for you, <laughs> you know, um, turning point for you in your career, you know, um, what's been a big turning point for you? Uh, it's an interesting story. So, I was running a business. I graduated law school, got sworn in. It was I realized I don't want to be a lawyer right now. I started a business when the internet was just kicking off and ran it for a number of years. And people used to come to me all the time and they'd say, hey, we, you're the only guy we know who understands internet and e-commerce and stuff like that. Can you help me? Can you help me? And I ended up getting a call from one of my first employees who had left and he, we stayed in touch and he says, listen, I think we should open up an agency together. And that was the big career change was setting aside the e-commerce business that I had because it was sort of running on its own and launching an agency with a guy who had put himself through college working for me and starting a business together with him. And we've been doing it for 16 years. And that was definitely a big unexpected pivot. I love these turning points. Um, and then Elon, for you, you know, people say, oh, he's on Curb Your Enthusiasm. They don't see all the decades of work. They also don't see what you did to meet Larry David. Decades and decades of work. And that Larry David is literally an hour and a half story. And I'm saving it for when I go on Howard. And, and, and not that you're not worthy of the story, but literally it's the longest story. Well, just, just give people a little, just a glimpse into the, it. The, the glimpse of it yeah. is that I was sick of waiting and asking my manager, can you get me an audition for Curb? I just want to go in. I just want to be a part of this historic, greatest, greatest uh, comedy show in the history of comedy. Like probably he topped himself because Seinfeld was the greatest and now Curb is. And I just wanted to be a part of it. Like I wanted to be a part of Seinfeld and I was doing this terrible sitcom. By the way, Jason has to leave. He shouldn't even. Oh, yeah. All right, I got to run. Ask Jason one more question. Come on. No, one more I don't for Jason. Mind. Honestly, this is about you. It's all good. I, I feel great being a matchmaker. Love you, Jason. Thank you. Enjoy. And by the way, I'm going to share one thing. I will say, even if you don't think impressions matter, I believe impressions from where you have your own observation and I'm the recipient of it. It's phenomenal because it, it takes your observation a step further because now you're doing it through a voice that adds texture to it. And True. that's just my feedback as a fan. I think it's like I look forward to seeing impressions, especially when they're your observation. If you're just mimicking them. Then yeah, you're that's not it. fun. It's got to be an, a joke and an observation with the voice. Of right. Course. It's like the Billy Crystal. It's not fun. It's not funny. It's like, <laughs> right. So it's just not fun. So it's, but it is, I look forward in a big way when I know I'm going to get your thoughts because Gary's not the only really brilliant observationist. It's, but when you give voice and texture to those things, it elevates. It's extra. It's literally like extra credit on a test. It's like, right. We're do, we, yeah, this is I'm throwing this in too at no extra charge. You're getting and a voice and an observation. I, I suppose it's like that's my smart. Student. Yeah, 
That's like my that. observation. So I, mean, I, I don't have much. Thank value. you for having an observation on my observations. <laughs> Be good, guys. Thanks, Thank Jason. You. Jason. Okay. So um, I, I, I was doing this sitcom uh, that was produced by Castle Rock. This is going back, I don't know, 20 something years. Um, and it was on the same lot as Jerry was doing his show. And again, produced by the same company, Castle Rock. So my show was terrible. I won't even say what it is because you won't have ever heard of it. It was on the WB. It was on for two episodes and then canceled. And I used to run from my soundstage and writer's room to Jerry's where it was a cool place to be. It was with the cool kids and the smart kids and just hanging out in that writer's room. And Jerry, you know, was kind of a fan. He knew I didn't pray. He would always ask me, do the Goldblum, do the Goldblum, do this, do that, you know, and I would do impressions <laughs> in front of everybody. And so I got to know the writers and became friendly with them. And, um, but I remember saying to the president of Castle Rock, I need to be a part of this last episode of Seinfeld. They're about to film. I got to, in some way, I don't care if I, I say two words, can I get your order? I, don't, I, I just want to be a part of history. This is the most historic, greatest thing that ever happened to television comedy. This is literally, it's Lucy on the family Seinfeld. It's like, it's, it's, this is it. And so he said, okay, we'll try to find you something. And they said, there's no speaking parts that are available for you to do. Like everything is just the cast and whatever. And would you want to be an extra in the diner, in the opening scene? And I was like, of course. And he goes, and, and we're having like a bunch of like, you know, interesting people sitting there like Rob Reiner, who is one of the heads of Castle Rock is we sitting there. The president of NBC is going to be sitting there. So you can go and be in the diner scene. I'm like, done. And that's a whole other story where I went into the diner and I messed up and slammed the door by accident. But anyway, and ruined the first take of the last episode of Seinfeld. But anyway, but I at least got to be there. That's your new and claim to fame. I ruined the, to fame. I ruined the first. But when you watch that last episode, it's like, oh, there I am. I'm, I'm a part of it in the tiniest way. But it was just so nice to be there, really, and to be a part of it in that way of just experiencing it. And it was the same with Curb. I wanted to be a part. I am in the comedy business. When you're in the comedy business, it's like when you're a student, you want to go to Harvard. And when you're in comedy, you want to do the Harvard of comedy. And right now that's Curb. And I just wanted to be a part of it. And instead of waiting, you don't wait for the phone to ring in show business or any business. I literally just um, barged into Larry's office on my birthday as a birthday gift to me which was 10 minutes of Larry. And luckily, because of my relationship with the Seinfeld writers, the great Jeff Schaefer, who runs Curb with Larry, spotted me. Like, just as the receptionist was about to look at me and throw me, have security literally throw me out or into prison, he went, Elon, what are you doing here? And I went, funny story, it's my birthday. And he go, oh, come on back. And then it's a whole story and it goes on. And that, I went back the following year and they weren't there. I went back a year later and they were there and that's all other story and that went great and all of my me both of my meetings with Larry were really great where I was really engaging him and making him laugh and obviously he was making me laugh and we had a rapport and I explained to him and again this is years in the making forget the 20 something years of being in comedy that where you get decent enough in your acting and your act and your writing where you or semi tiny bit worthy to be a part of that show in any small way, but the tenacity of years of waiting. And then I said to Larry, I want to be a part of this. And that's what I said to Jerry, I wanted to be, and they threw me in that, you know, as an extra, but I'll do, I'll do anything. And he goes, oh, okay. He goes, yeah. And I, I know what you can do and I know what you can't do. And I'm like, what can't I do? There are things you can't do. There are things you can't do. And by the way, one of the things I can't do is a good Larry David, but anyway, so, <laughs> so, and then, and then they offered me this role, and then it gets cut, and now I have a bigger role. So it was a little thing we call bashert, meant to be. It was meant to be that I was cut with all that pain and the year plus of waiting. It now paid off from, I'm really a, an integral part of the season where I, my character shows up in a few scenes, in a few episodes, so it's exciting. Elon, was it a tough decision for you if someone goes and watches, and we'll, we'll put that in the notes, um, uh, where people can watch the James Corden bit, but um, was it a Just tough to decision? Google, Elon Gold on James Corden. Yeah. Your your opener um, that you started with on there um, was that a tough decision? Do you mean the first word just being Jews? 
it's exactly. just, it's yeah. just funny when I would work it out on the, the hardest thing is that icebreaker. That's the hardest to ask any comedian is just starting. And I noticed that when I just got on stage and just went, um, Jews and everyone just laughed. They just know, oh, this is going to be fun. And, and again, talk about leaning into what you are and who you are and all that. So it's, it, it wasn't as bold and as daring as you think because it had been worked out for like a couple of years where I would open with that. And I loved it. And it's not a joke. It's just a word, but it's just funny. And then it goes into a bit, which I'm very proud of, which is the sex, money, and food bit. And the reason that I love that bit is because it dispels our negative stereotype. All Jews care about is money. And I have the whole audience ask, what do you think is our number one? They all yell money. And I'm like, how dare you? And you're wrong. It's food. And I correct them. And I love that bit because it's not just jokes. I'm actually saying something. I'm saying, no, you dumb anti-Semites. It is food we're obsessed with. We don't care about money. We only need money to buy food. And, and that's why I'm like proud of that bit because it doesn't just kill. There's a message behind the jokes. And then the next bit, which is the parking bit, I just love and I honed that for a whole summer every night doing three sets a night. And I finally got that right. And, uh, and that's just an analogy. That's an amazing bit. Yeah. People just have to, to do it justice. They have to just go watch the full, watch the full thing. But on that part, uh, Elon, you know, the, the anti-Semitism thing, you know, you're probably on the road in various cities all over the U S and Canada. Um, are there times where you ever experienced that in your show? Like, because you are talking about Judaism or things related, or maybe not? I have experienced it, you know, even um, in different forms, like even at the Montreal Comedy Festival, I did a one-man show called Elon Gold Pro Semite, which I think is <laughs> going to be the title of my next special. And, and I was talking about this hate incident that happened to me and my family, and I was also talking about the Middle East, and I was talking about Israel and how basically the message, whatever the jokes were, there's a lot of jokes, but the message was how all I want and all most of us want is peace coexistence. We just want, you know, like for the, the majority of Israeli society wants nothing, nothing but coexistence. And they've proven that with the peace, the Abraham Accords with peace uh, agreements with Egypt and with attempted peace with all the Palestinian leadership and always failed because the Palestinian leadership from Arafat to Abbas to now even Hamas are just horrible and don't want peace. They just want a Jew free Palestine. And, and, and um, so I was just explaining this in the most sort of loving, like pro peace, pro coexistence way. And a guy gets up and just starts walking out and I'm like, where, where are you going? It was like in front of this big 400, see theater and you see him he's like towards the front just getting up and leaving and he goes uh i'm palestinian i don't like anything you're saying and i'm like that we should have peace <laughs> that we should live together and try to uh, in harmony and, and he just stormed out and that's just whatever that's not even anti-semitism there, there's been so you know there, luckily have been so few incidents um on stage or but i remember even when I was first starting out and I, I had a gig in Kentucky and the guy comes up, we should close with this because it's a great little story. By the way, yesterday I did a podcast. I was cheating on you. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't do a lot. I don't, I don't know if you know, this is a very special thing. I, I think I've, I can count on one hand because as I was telling you before we started, I wish I was listening to your podcast because you're such a bright, insightful guy. And I just don't listen to anything except an occasional Howard Stern whenever I have, I have four kids and I'm always running around developing projects and gigs. And so I just don't sit and listen to podcasts. I wish I did. I know the whole world does. I'd love to hear yours. I'm definitely gonna listen to this one because God, I was good in it anyway. But no, I, um, and I was, um, what was I saying? Oh yeah. Kentucky. Right. So I'm in Kentucky. Oh, oh, that's what I was saying, that we should do a part two. So yesterday I did a podcast and it was my part two because it went so well. It was like, we're not, we haven't even scratched the surface. Let's do it. So I will grant you a part two. You I watched earned- the part one of that one, oh, that's by the funny. way. Yes, I did. Yeah. You, you've earned the part. Yeah. You're so damn good. You may be one of the best podcast hosts oh. I've, I've, I've spoken to. Thank um, you. And Ari Lamb is also brilliant. You got to hear his uh, faith um, podcast, uh, Good Faith. Anyway, so... Here's the point. We should continue this in a part two. 
But going back to Kentucky, it's a, it's a story that I turned into a bit that I used to do in my act where I was in Kentucky and the guy who booked me comes over to me after the show and he goes, you know why I brought you Jews down here? And I was like, are there others? I lived that, in I think, Kentucky, by the way, for a year. So. did? In Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, yeah. wow. That yeah. must have been. There's insane. one JCC, I think, in all of Kentucky. It's in Louisville. Amazing. So, yeah. Amazing. So, uh, no, so he says to me, I got to hear more about that, by the way, about your experience in Kentucky. Yeah. So he says, you know why? You know why I brought you Jews down here? And I went, are there others? What do you be? You know, I'm looking around like, and he goes, because you Jews. It was just me, by the way. He goes, because you Jews is funny. I'm like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess we're funny. He goes, yeah, you Jews, let me tell you, you think about all them funny Jews. You got, you got the Adam Sandler Berg. You got Ben Stiller Stein, <laughs> Jerry Seinenfeld. I mean, he's adding Jewishness to already pretty Jewy names. And he goes, all you Jews is funny as hell, which, by the way, is a place you're going to burn unless you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> And I just immediately like just froze and just <laughs> turned into Woody Allen. I was like, you know, I only accept Visa and MasterCard. You know? And and it was like, <laughs> it was such a shocking thing that he's telling me I'm going to burn <sighs> in hell for being Jewish unless oh, I accept God. Jesus. And that's why he brought me down because you Jews is funny. And it was like, oh my, I literally went to my hotel room, triple locked the door. I think I like slept in my clothes, just woke up the next morning and left. <laughs> but yeah, you experience it. And I had, you could Google Ugh. Elon Gold hate incident that happened to me and my family. We're all fine, but it, it was just words, luckily. I didn't just, hear that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, listen, unfortunately, it's rearing its ugly head yeah. in, a, in a much bigger way now. It's sort of subsiding a bit where, thank God, we're not feeling threatened. Like we can't walk out on the street with a yarmulke or go to a kosher restaurant. There were attacks in LA and New York. I mean, you forget Kentucky, the you know, cosmopolitan cities. There have been many numerous attacks enough to have us all scared and and uh but i feel like that also coincides with what's going on in israel so when when hamas starts up with israel and israel defends itself and has to retaliate all of course always aiming at uh targets and missile sites and never people in fact calling and saying we're about to hit this building full of missiles so we don't have our people killed we don't want to kill your people either you may want to ask them to evacuate and then they'll bomb it which is like what other moral army does that and then still israel gets blamed and because no matter what there'll be casualties of war and every death on both sides is a tragedy so when there are deaths on their side it emboldens all these people to hate Israel even more. They're murdering Palestinian kids. Like, no, 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 no. If Hamas didn't fire a rocket, there wouldn't be one dead on either side. But either way, they just look at this conflict from this, the conflict from a lens of total, just a totally incorrect based on Bella Hadid's and, you know, <laughs> false narratives like apartheid and, and, and ethnic cleansing. And they just get so angry that it translates into we're going to attack Jews on the streets the way, you know, Trump calling it the China virus. And then there were attacks on Asian people because people are so angry as they should be at the Chinese government for unleashing this and allowing it and all the lies and misinformation that happened from there as they should be angry at the Chinese government, but not at Asian people walking down the street who have nothing to do with Wuhan and the lab and what went on and the cover ups and all that. You got to be insane to attack a Chinese person and you have to be insane to attack a Jew for a conflict in the Middle East that is started by a terrorist group. And and but again, it does embolden them. They're killing them. We're going to kill them. We're going to attack them. So it happens. These flare ups happen where it spills out over into the streets and then just your average Jew is getting attacked because of what's going on thousands of miles away that you have no nothing to do with. So, but but it's calmed down now because the conflict is 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 in a bit of a lull now. Thank God, till the next flare up. But yeah, it's it's out there. It's prevalent, and um, it's always under the surface. I think a lot of people just need a reason to hate, whether it's racism, whether it's anti-Semitism. You know, they just need that uh, that blood libel. They kill Jesus. Let's kill them. You know, they're killing Palestinians. Let's kill them. It's just they just need that reason. But um, this is a longer conversation. We don't have time to get into this. So I want to. No, I, I really, I want to get deeper into some things. Maybe in the part two, as far as you know, the commonalities between blacks and Jews. Um, I'd love to hear more kind of extend this conversation on the controversial bits um, 
that you've had, um, maybe you don't even consider them controversial, but once you actually release them into the audience, you know, They're slightly edgy, edgy. Um, but I kind of want to end this one in line because I know you have to run mm. in a minute with a couple lessons you learned um, from colleagues and mentors, a couple lessons from Dave Chappelle, a couple lessons you've learned from Larry David or anyone else um, that you can think of. You know, it's so funny because from Chappelle, literally, literally from studying him as a kid when nobody knew who he was, and I would just watch him and in awe. Um, and I remember just having the thought, everything that he says is precious. And Seinfeld and Rock also taught me this, that the words are precious. I used to just go on stage and again, do impressions or just mess around. But what you're saying is so precious and important. And obviously we all need jokes. We all need to get laughs. But again, if you're saying something that's bigger than the joke, if there's a meaning and message behind it, you know, obviously with Dave, it's a lot to do with black culture, with fighting against, against racism, against police brutality, you know, and, and, and it's, Again, talking about what you know and what you care about and what you're mad at, you know, like he's mad, rightfully so, about the injustice and inequality that we're still facing or they are. Did I just say we? Anyway, um, or many of us groups are facing and that lesson of like, you know, be careful with not be careful, but make sure that you're not just up there, you know, doing jokes. Now, again, there are so many comedians that are just silly and goofy or just have funny observations about regular daily life or relationships. They're not necessarily saying, but they're still, again, speaking on the human experience and allowing us all to connect as a, as a, as a human race. And sometimes it's not about just race, it's about the human race, and that's important as well. But just care about the craft, work hard at it. I never in my first few years, it came so easily to me because impressions are a natural, innate, inborn gift, God-given. I take no credit for that little talent that I have. And I would just use my little minimal talents and just do them and have fun with them. I never worked hard. I never spent hours a day like I do now writing. I never hit the stage every night like I try to do now. Um, I would do it when I wanted to and write a joke here and there and whatever, and whatever came to me, I'd write down. But you got it. There's a work ethic. There is, there is. I learned so much from Rock, Chappelle, Seinfeld about work ethic and how the preciousness of every word and every bit is a lot to be learned. And as far as the edgy stuff, I love talking about um, subject matter that again, bothers me. And with comedy, it's what, but what's bothering you now? A lot of it. And that's what my whole thing is like, you know, I don't mean to complain, but, and then I start complaining about something. And it's because all of comedy is really complaining. We're complaining about things. We're complaining about our wives or husbands. We're complaining about our president. We're complaining about everything, everyday life. And a lot of what I like to complain about is big topics like anti-Semitism, like homophobia, like racism. So if you're gonna go there, it's gonna be edgy. And in my special, I literally use the N-word when I'm telling a story about my experience, you know, with this guy that said it to me. And, I, and the whole joke is to say the word. You can't do the joke and go, and the N-word, it ruins the joke. So I'm saying the, the word, but I'm not using it. In fact, the opposite. I am talking about it in, you know, in, in a way that to illustrate how it disgusts me, how that word is the most dehumanizing, despicable word. And I think if you're on the right side of the thing you're talking about, it's okay to use the word. We don't have to be babies and go, you know, the N word, you know, if I'm on the right side against the word, I'm going to use the word, even if that offends people. And I'm going to use other words. And, and, you know, 
I, my, you know, I, I, I always talk to my gay brother about using the word faggot on stage. As long as I'm against the word and I'm on the right side of it, I'm going to use it. Kike, I'm, I'm allowed to use, but still, you really shouldn't say kike. Well, unless you're against it and showing how terrible the word is, you say the K word. What am I going to say? So, yeah, I go to these edgy places, but it's really comes from such a place of like, love all people. You know, I have a line in my act go, the only group, how do you hate groups of people? Like the only groups of people I hate are hate groups. I can't, how, how do you hate groups of people when there are so many individuals out there to hate? Why would you pick on a group? So, you know, it come, it, it really, the whole theme, and I, I hope you you picked up on that a little bit in in all those bits in Chosen and Taken where it's all about just commonalities and we're all one people and blah 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 and can't we all just get along even though we never can and never will i love it elon first of all let's point people towards where they can check out more i know they can go to elongold.com where else yes. should Follow we point me on people? instagram at elon gold my special streaming on amazon prime you go to youtube type in my name a lot of fun clips will show up i'm all over the place and then i'm on the dr j podcast rise up the best the best. We got to do a part two. Part two it is. Elon. We only scratched it. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. You. We'll see you on the other side. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.